on the lateral surface of the abdominal wall, you'll come on to the lateral surface of the, of the ascending colon at this point. If, first of all, let me elevate the greater momentum out of the way, lift it upward, so you can better appreciate the outline of the ascending colon. Come onto the lateral surface of the ascending colon, then onto the anterior surface, and finally onto the medial surface of the ascending colon, then back onto the posterior body wall, where it becomes parietal peritoneum again. Proceeding across the vertebral bodies, you then approach the right side of the mesentery of the small intestine, and come around the small intestine, and down the left side of the mesentery of the small intestine. Coming down the left side of the mesentery of the small intestine, back onto the verbal column, this time down into the left, paraverbal gutter, then over the medial surface of the descending colon. At this point, you can identify the descending colon. Come up medial surface of that, across the anterior surface, then down along the lateral surface, and then finally back to the parietal perineum of the lateral uh, abdominal wall. Now, you'll notice that both the descending colon as well as the ascending colon on the other side tend to lie in the para paravertebral gutters. And they tend to divide paravertebral gutters up into a sort of a, a more medially situated trough and a more laterally situated trough. And it's important to recognize as you're exploring the peritoneal cavity that the, the, the paravertebral gutters are a relatively dependent part of the uh, peritoneal cavity. And that when you're lying in a, in a supine position, uh, as you follow the uh, gravitational flow of fluids within the peritoneal cavity, fluids would tend to run up the paravertebral gutter toward the diaphragm if fluids accumulate above the level of the external iliac, common iliac and external iliac vessels that run along the, the brim of the pelvis. So there's, if the fluids accumulate below this level, they'll tend to drain down into the, into the pelvic cavity. So actually, we sort of have a watershed here along the pelvic brim, seen here on the right, on the left side. Perhaps it'll be better visualized on the right side where you can see the pelvic brim along here. And any fluid which accumulates in the abdomen, whether it be pus or blood, uh, above this watershed line of the inlet to the pelvis will tend to flow upward in the paravertebral gutter toward the diaphragm above. Or if fluid accumulates below this level, it'll tend to go downward into the pelvic basin. After studying, the jejunum ilium and large intestine, we want you next locate their blood supply. First of all, if you'll turn your attention to the area of the, the transverse mesocolon, and note again the second and third parts of the duodenum, how they descend along the right side of the vertebral column and then cross the front of the vertebral column towards the left. At that point, you can pick up superior mesenteric vessels as they emerge from the pancreas within the duodenal loop and pass across the front of the third part of the duodenum. Now, I do this by simply palpating them first of all to see if you can identify them by feel, and then simply spread apart the peritoneum over their surfaces. Strip the peritoneum from the surface. Then you should be able to identify the superior mesenteric vessels as well as their nerve plexus and lymphatic plexus that accompany them. Then we want you to strip the peritoneum completely from the right side of the mesentery in order to identify the major branches of the superior mesenteric artery, as well as its accompanying veins, lymphatics, and nerve plexus. The other branches of the superior mesenteric vessel can be identified by stripping the peritoneum from the undersurface of the transverse musical in the following manner. Again, note the accompanying veins, nerve plexuses, and lymphatics. After identifying the branches of the superior mesenteric vessel, then turn the small intestines and their mesentery upward, and turn your attention to the left side uh, of the mesentery of the small intestines, following it down to the point where it attaches to the posterior body wall, uh, you can pick up the bottom edge of the third part of the wad running across the front of the vertebral column at this point, and also the aorta can be palpated. Then if you, if you uh, strip the peritoneum from the left side of the aorta, 
you should be able to locate just above its bifurcation and just below the third part of the duodenum, you should be able to locate the inferior mesenteric artery, which comes off the left side of the aorta and usually emerges in from beneath the third part of the duodenum. Uh, and then you can trace it and its various venous, lymphatic, and nerve axis accompaniments out to their distribution by stripping the peritoneum from their surfaces after you located the main stem. Now, the, the uh, inferior mesenteric vein, however, while its branches ramify with this artery, will not pass back directly to the uh, inferior vena cava, but instead will ascend on the left side of the vertebral column to enter the splenic vein within the substance of the pancreas. You're now viewing the abdomen from an anterior view and also somewhat from the left eye. You'll know for purposes of orientation the liver and the right upper quadrant. And this is the point at which we cut the greater omentum as we remove the transverse colon, the part of the intestinal specimen. Here you can see the pyloric portion of the stomach and body of the stomach, and way up under here, the fumps of the stomach. Now, after you complete your study of stomach, the next thing you should attempt to do is find some of its innervation and blood supply. One of the first things you want to locate on the anterior aspect of the stomach is a trunk, which is called the anterior vagal trunk. If you retract the liver upward and look at the anterior aspect of the stomach, I think you can visualize there's a nerve trunk in this location, coming through the diaphragm. And if you pass up into the, this is the anterior vagal trunk, and if you put a hand up in the thorax where you previously identified this trunk, as it lie on top of the esophagus, and then pull on the nerve, you'll see that that is in fact the anterior vagal trunk. And this way you can establish its continuity with the anterior vagal trunk as it forms on the anterior surface of the esophagus and trace it through the diaphragm. So there we see the anterior vagal trunk, not only giving branches to the stomach, but also some branches which pass across the lesser momentum of the liver. Now, if you take the stomach and, and lift it upward, so you're looking at the stomach bed. You can identify over here on the, on the right, you can see the duodenal loop. You can follow the first part of the duodenum, second part of the duodenum, and the third part of the duodenum coming across here. And then, of course, at this point, the head of the pancreas. And you can see how the tail of the pancreas now visualized helps to form. The body and tail of the pancreas helps to form a good deal of the, of the stomach bed. The stomach was resting against the, this portion of the body and tail of the pancreas. And if we get the stomach up and we drag it up out of the way, you can see there are also some vessels lying here in the stump bed within the, what used to be the lesser sac before we destroyed it by dissection. Uh, you see a vessel that's almost coming straight towards you and then dividing up in three inches. This is the celiac trunk, which is just a short trunk before it divides into its conopatic and left gastric and sonic branches. So you see it comes straight at you at this point and then it divides into those three branches. It sort of trifurcates. Well, now you can use the left gastric artery a located nerve trunk, which comes through the diaphragm here, right along the left gastric artery, and into a plexus around the celiac artery. This is the posterior vagal trunk, and you can use the left gastric artery as your landmark to, posterior, to locate the posterior vagal trunk. Now, along either side of the celiac trunk, if we hold the celiac trunk up, but along either side of the celiac trunk, you would find a relatively large ganglion. See this large swelling right here? And come into this ganglion below, there's a nerve trunk. Now this ganglion is the celiac ganglion. We blot some of the juices from the surface, perhaps that'll be more easy to visualize. Here you can identify this ganglionic mass just adjacent to the celiac artery. And here you see a nerve trunk coming into it. Now this is the greater sphincteric nerve, bringing the sympathetic ganglionics into the celiac trunk. And from this point, they'll be joined by the posterior vagal trunk fibers coming in along the left gastric. And then the combined sympathetic and parasympathetic will distribute as a plexus of nerves along the celiac trunk and its various branches. Now viewing the abdominal cavity in an anterior view, after completing the study of the duodenal loop and its relationships, we next like you to turn your attention to the uh, lesser omentum previously identified into the epiplic foramen because we'd like you to dissect 
some of the important masculine and biliary structures in the right free edge of the lateral middle. The way we'd like you to do that is to simply strip peritoneum from the surface of these structures. And then you'll notice that, that there are two structures lying in a relatively anterior position if the relationship are normal. The structure which lies anteriorly and to the right will be the common bile duct. Lying anteriorly and to the left will be the upper hepatic artery, which in this specimen appear to be dying very early into its right and left hepatic branches. See the two branches. Here's the right and the left hepatic artery. Then be behind and between both of these structures is a very large venous channel, which I'll pull forward here, the fourth vein. But you should identify these three structures, the common bile duct, the upper hepatic artery, and the portal vein here in the right free margin of the lesseral venom, and then trace branches of the vessels up to the liver and backward to the celiac trunk. You can also note some of the branches of the celiac plexus here distributing as branches to the liver in the so-called hepatic plexus, which derive from the celiac plexus. After completing study of the pancreas, we want you to neck open the descending or second part of the duodenum in order to identify the duodenal pellet which lies therein. Then the duodenum can be everted in order to identify the duodenal papilla, which looks like a small nipple with an opening on its apex, as you see at this point. This is the point which both the main pancreatic duct and the common bile duct typically empty their secretions into the gastrointestinal tract. Now, in order to complete the study uh, of these two ducts, we'd like you to lift the duodenal loop forward and by book the section breaking through the peritoneum, completely rotate the duodenal loop the contained head of the pancreas to the left. So you're actually looking at its posterior surface. I've taken it and moved it completely to the left. So we're now looking at the back surface of the duodenal loop and uh, the head of the pancreas. At this point, you can pick up the common bile duct where it was previously identified in the free margin of the last omen, and you can trace it downward. Uh, dissecting it out of the back of the pancreas, and this will lead you to the main pancreatic duct, which will end at a slightly lower level, typically. It will lead you right to the duodenal pillar. You can see now I've stripped the pancreatic, the small amount of pancreatic tissue on the deep surface of the duct away and taken the duct to the point where it's almost uh, entering the wall of the duodenum. Now, just below that, at just slightly lower level than that, is where the main pancreatic duct should come in. So you can use the common bile duct as your landmark for picking up and identifying, visualize its point. Common, the main pancreatic duct, and then you trace the main pancreatic duct out through the substance of the pancreas, incising and separating as necessary. You can see the main pancreatic duct and the common bile duct, as they, in this case, appear to join together just before they penetrate the wall of the duodenum. Enter the duodenal pellet. Next, we want you to pick up the common bile duct again. This time, brace it up into the liver by blunt dissection, identifying the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct. And you can trace the common hepatic duct up to the point where it divides into right and left hepatic ducts. But note, running across the triangle, or the angle between the common hepatic duct and cystic duct, we have a small cystic artery going off as a branch, in this case, of the right hepatic. All these biliary particles should be completely dissected out as well as the branches of the proper hepatic artery if they were not previously detected. Then you should turn your attention to the portal vein and trace the portal vein down into the substance of the pancreas, dissecting away wherever pancreatic tissue is necessary in order to demonstrate its makeup as it's formed by coming together of the pyramidary vein and the splenic vein. And the further you can take the splenic vein out to the point where it is joined by the pyramidary. We're now viewing the abdominal cavity 
from an anterior view and also somewhat from the left. In order to identify the autonomic plexuses in the front of the aorta, you should first of all review the major arteries that branch from the aorta to the gastrointestinal tract. The celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. You can use these for orientation in locating plexuses. Now, earlier, along the side of the celiac trunk, we identified the celiac ganglion, here visualized. And passing into the celiac ganglion, coming through the diaphragm, the greater splanchnic nerve. Also coming to the area where the celiac plexus will form, come through the diaphragm at this point, we have the posterior vagal trunk. Here we see the posterior vagal trunk and the greater splanchnic nerve providing input to the celiac plexus. You'll notice that these vessels are, are not nice and clean because of the plexuses that enwrap them. From the celiac ganglion and plexus, you'll also note that there are branches at this point passing on to the spheromentary artery, the spheromentary plexus, which is located just below the celiac trunk. Also from the ganglion, there are branches which pass on to the renal vessels. and other branches which continue on as renal plexus, and other branches which continue on beyond the renal vessels to enter the intermesenteric plexus. That is the plexus located between the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. But you'll note that the intermesenteric plexus not only receives contributions from the celiac ganglion and plexus areas, but it also receives some other inputs called the lumbar splanchnic nerves, which are derived from the lumbar sympathetic trunk, visualized at this point. I think you can see here's a darker colored ganglion in this location of the lumbar sympathetic ganglion located just alongside the aorta. Here's the aorta, just alongside the aorta and along the anterolateral aspect of the vertebral bodies at this point. So here we see the lumbar sympathetic trunk giving off lumbar splanchnic nerves into the intermesenteric plexus. From the intermesenteric plexus, nerves continue out along the intermesenteric vessels and others continue down over the bifurcation of the aorta to form the superior hypogastric plexus, which then passes down to the pelvis. The bifurcation of the aorta perhaps will be better visualized if I retract inferimentary vessels to one side. There you see the aortic bifurcation. And here are the superior hypogastric plexuses, which can be followed from the bifurcation of the aorta down into the pelvis. Viewing the abdominal cavity in an anterior view, after you complete the study of the inferior vena cava and the aorta and its various in their various branches, we want you next to locate the major lymphatic trunk of the abdominal cavity. Now, uh, a good landmark to do this is the previously section right renal vessels. Here's the right renal vein, and if I pick up the inferior vena cava and retract it over toward the left, and then you locate your right renal artery. If you look in the area to the right of the aorta and somewhat behind the aorta. I'm going to pick up the aorta and retract it to the left. And you probe within the connective tissues in that area. You should be able to locate lymphatic structures, the major lymphatic trunks of the abdominal cavity, for example. Uh, here you can see some of the right lumbar lymph nodes forming a right lumbar lymphatic trunk and a left lumbar lymphatic trunk coming in from the other side. These trunks come together, and in some specimens, this point may form a dilated cisternic chyla. Now, in this specimen, there is not a cisternic chyla, and this is a common occurrence. And it's at this point that the thoracic duct will develop and pass up behind the diaphragm to the thorax, where we previously identified. Now, in order to confirm the fact that the structure you pick up here are, in, are the thoracic duct and cisternic chyla structures, you reach up in the thorax and grab previously identified thoracic duct and tug on it, I think you can see that this structure really is the thoracic duct, which is coming with the aorta, just on the right side of the aorta and behind the aorta, uh, into the uh, area where the cisternic hyla might, might be located. duct 
which is coming with the aorta, just on the right side of the aorta and behind the aorta, uh, into the uh, area where the saturnic column might 